Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With me today is Daniel McAdams, our co-host. Daniel, good to see you. How are you this morning, Dr. Paul? Doing, doing well, doing well, and uh, let's talk a little bit about Venezuela today. Let's. But before we get into Venezuela, you know, I wanted to just uh, make one comment, you know, because really still in the news is the, uh, uh, you, you know, the investigation and Mueller's report, and that looks like it's going to be going on for a long time. And yeah. It's pretty amazing, the people who sort of lost out on that. It, there's no humility <laughs> and, and no shame. They're on to the next thing, and they're going to keep that going forever and ever. Yeah. But it looks like they don't even need to do that because there's another case, and this is uh, more local, but it's a reflection of our judicial system, and, and that's that Smollett thing yeah. in Chicago. How could anything be, you know, uh, so seemingly so clear-cut? At least the charges were made, and, and all of a sudden, it is gone. So I, I would say that we have a big, big problem. It, it's uh, uh, throughout our whole society, and it's so much of it's related uh, to the justice system. So it, it's, it's a shame as far as I'm concerned, you know, about that. But I guess that'll be around for a while, too. <laughs> but uh, I want to talk today again about uh, Venezuela, you know, and the escalation that's going on there. And we have talked about that recently, too, about, you know, the Russians are uh, defending their turf the way they see it. You know, they have investments there. China has investments there. There's oil, oil there. And uh, there was an election and people are arguing who, who got elected uh, and who, who kind of devotes and whatever. And um, I see that as a Venezuelan problem <laughs> and, and not a justification for us saying, hey, you know, it's a mess down there. We have to come to our rescue, and, and we, are, we are the exceptional nations, the most powerful nation in the world. We know everything. We have all wisdom. So therefore, we're going to pick a guy, and, and we do. We pick Guaido and say, well, you know, he, he says he's in line, and he qualifies under their constitution, which is uh, questionable and something I don't want to get into as much as I want to make the point that, um, you know, they have a problem, and uh, we've contributed to that problem over decades because we have uh, not been willing to talk to or trade with the country. Oh, they're communists. Well, you know, we've, we've dealt with communists before, like the Chinese and the Russians and, and the Soviets and all along. But one example that I think is a good analogy here is uh, the policy that we had with Cuba, you know, for 40 or 50 years because we were fighting communism, yeah. and yet we solidified the power of the guy we hated. And, uh, and that thing is still going on. So here we, we are obsessed with getting involved even before the crisis became so major. Major, you know, uh, and, and we, we've been involved uh, with our CIA and, uh, you know, tr trying to undermine that government for a long time, which is the principle that I want to address it because I think we shouldn't do it. I think it's wrong. It's not part of our Constitution. And the, there's too many unintended consequences and it tends to backfire. And there is, we, we have said it so often, the policies fail they fail and yet we continue to con continue to do it but right now there's this big big fight over there but but it looks it's escalation and uh you know the russians have sent some planes in there they talk about uh food and soldiers and i'm sure there's some weaponry and in this sort of thing and in their argument well we're, we're their friends and we have we're an ally and and we have this so well i i think that um this is not going to go away, but I'm still, ad, uh, I, I still believe that uh, uh, we're not going to have U.S. troops marching in there. We probably already have, <laughs> you know, special forces and CIA troops around there, but we're, we're not going to march in there. And I don't think we're going to have that guerrilla war, which would be very, very bad. I hope we have more brains than to start that fight, especially with Russian troops in there. But Russia is obviously wanting to protect their interests by, you know, getting one step up. So so somebody say, see, it's, it's the Russians' fault. So they're escalating it. But if you look at the big picture, it's not quite so easy to uh, place blame like that. And that's true. And it's, you know, it's really tiring, again, to have to deal with the issue that if you oppose what is really uh, probably the most transparent regime change that we've done, if you oppose that, you're a commie. Just like if, you know, when you oppose the Iraq war, oh, you, you'd love Saddam Hussein. And when you oppose the overthrow of Gaddafi, oh, it's just because you love Gaddafi. <laughs> Uh, you know, in Syria, oh, you're an Assad lover, you love Assad. It's really tiring to have this always thrown at you, 
even at times by libertarians. You know, the idea that somehow if we don't like what's happening, we know that regime changes are always based on lies every single time. We've just had a big debunking of lies with the Russia Gate, <laughs> but somehow if we say they're lying to us again, this is all lies. Uh, oh, you're just a commie. You know, it's, <laughs> it's just tiring. Well, the one thing is, is that the American people have, they have to be waking up a little bit and say, you know, I'm not going to believe anything they tell me anymore. But uh, there's a lot of people susceptible and, and are gullible. You know, they, they hear and say, oh, this, this, is what, um, this is what they're telling us now. But some of them really want to hear what they want to believe, and there's no evidence for it. So all you have to do is have a demagogue out there, and they, and they feed into that. But that, that, of course, gets people mistreated. That's why I think the position of uh, personal liberty and non-intervention and, and trying to be as honest as possible and, uh, and, and present the facts and not taking these sides when it's, it's not in our interest and is so unnecessary because our national security is, is not threatened. That's why it bothers me the most, and I've said it many times, this whole argument that, uh, that people get drafted and sent off, I think of the draft because I was drafted, for national security purposes, you know, to, to save, save the Constitution. And even on the Middle East, that was the excuse all the time, to protect our liberties. And you never, you never heard anybody on the media say, yeah, thank you for your service for protecting my Constitution and my freedom. That's why I went to Iraq. And you never hear somebody in the media say, tell me, how well did you, what did you do? Why am I safer now because you're over there? And uh, why are those individuals who either uh, uh, were, were killed or lost limbs? Uh, explain it to them. So that's why there's just no doubt in my mind that uh, the problem of the world, and there'll be plenty and they'll exist forever, can be better sorted out if you have just a few people getting together in a few countries and saying, look, we're going to mind our own business, which has happened though, throughout history. It's not, it's not like it never happened before, and uh, we just need more of that. But it's up to us, since we right now are in the driver's seat because we have the financial uh, wherewithal, we have the military, and we have the attitude that we own the world. So that is the reason why I think that it's very important that we continue to uh, you know, get the message out there uh, from our viewpoint and why uh, we would be better off and why we can't afford this and why the world would be better off. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a tough slog. It is. And the neocons depend on lies and deceptions. The thing is, if you're anti-war, you can't repeat war propaganda, you know, which is what they do. But and this is so the whole commie thing, you're commie if you if you disagree. I mean, there's a couple of myths I think it wouldn't be bad to dispel. First of all, the idea that Maduro did not win the election. Okay, we don't know that if it was free or fair. However, we know that he did win because the other guys didn't run. <laughs> you know, imagine if, if Trump had pulled out and then Hillary won. He said, well, that's not fair. She got all the votes. If they wanted to get the votes, they shouldn't have won. I found a couple of numbers that are sort of interesting, and, and we'll be, I'll be accused of defending Venezuela, but I just want to look in context. A personal income tax rate, for example, because we talk, it's a communist country. Uh, it's 34% across the board. That's high. I don't like that. Uh, in Germany, it's 49.8%. <laughs> in France, it's 45%. Uh, percent of total employment in the public sector, Venezuela is 29. That sounds terrible. But France is 24.9. Uh, Norway is 37.8. So basically in there, uh, number of government-owned enterprises, that's another good indication of socialism. Venezuela has had 511. That's a lot. That's terrible. But next door in Brazil, they have 418. So yes, it's, it's a dumb system. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bad situation, but it's not, we're not, it's not North Korea. You know? <laughs> Yes, and, uh, and we've been involved for a while. A lot of people don't realize that, but uh, we've inter interfered in, in the way we throw sanctions around. I mean, ever since uh, in the last couple of years, we've just put more and more sanctions on them. But we had a couple of our leaders speak out about this. Pompeo was uh, at it again, as well as uh, our, uh, our illustrious uh, advisor to the president, Bolton. He's going to tell us what to do. But Pompeo said that... Uh, 
this whole thing about the Russians sending those airplanes, that's unconstructive, you yeah. know. It's, un, it's unconstructive behavior, and he better quit. So, uh, yeah, we're not going to let him go, but sometimes this, is, uh, this will be a lot, of, a lot of talk because it's, it's not just going to go away, and we're not going to march in with the troops, but we're going to put on more sanctions and do different things and keep punishing the people. And, and that's the other thing that we don't talk about a whole lot, but when we put on these sanctions, we're always trying to punish the leaders, but the leaders never get punished. The people suffer, and the people are supposed to rebel and throw out those bad guys, but it, but it just hasn't worked that way, and uh, yet this is what we're doing right now. And um, and, and Bolton, of course, you, you know, had a few words to say, and uh, he he knows our history. He said we should uh, follow <laughs> follow the Monroe Doctrine, but I would say he only knows half of the history. Yeah. He, he doesn't know the whole thing because I think the Russians know our history <laughs> because they they talk about well, if you were following the Monroe Doctrine, uh, may, maybe uh, you wouldn't be on our borders pestering us to death, and that was part of the doctrine as well. Yeah, the other half of it. You know, Pompeo, you mentioned. He actually made a joke when the electricity went out. The misery that happened when it went out, and we don't know if it was sabotage or if it's just because they probably have some pretty junky old stuff that they don't care, take care of. We do know that there has been sabotage. We know from Stuxnet that the U.S. does get involved in sabotaging foreign countries that way. But he laughed. He put out a tweet. He just thought it was funny. Maduro's going next. The lights are out. And for Bolton, I think we have some tweets here to, to look at. That's always entertaining. I'm not sure if we, if we have them, but... Um, it's always entertaining to watch what Bolton's up to, but he's feverishly meeting with other Latin American defense ministers. And I don't know if that's for show or if it's, um, if it's uh, he's actually trying to get them on board. So um, I guess we don't have the tweets there. But uh, So he met with the Brazilian defense minister, and uh, that's okay. He met with the Brazilian defense minister, and he tweeted out something it's suggesting that, hey, we got the Brazilians on board for military intervention. And right afterward, there was a clarification. The Brazilian defense minister said, we don't believe we're not going to be involved in the military at all. He also met with the Honduran defense minister. So he's either, he, at the very least, he's trying to show Venezuela, hey, I'm meeting with these guys. We're putting all the ducks in a row. Psychological warfare, maybe. Yeah, and, and you know, when the lights go off, too, uh, uh, their system hasn't been known for having the best power system in the world. Uh, they, they, they've been made fun of because they don't have many likes at nighttime. But at the same time, you know, it, it just seems like uh, these two uh, these two times a little bit more than coincidental. And you, we, we just wonder who who's who's accomplishing that. Is it just a coincidence? But uh, they. Um, you know, if, if my assumption is right, they, we're not going to be uh, landing a uh, large number of troops and initiating the, the guerrilla warfare. There's going to be uh, a lot of activity. But the, the one thing is, is um, our position has been pretty adamant. We have taken this position that the, the Russians just can't, you know, get away with this and we have to take care of it. So my, my concern for escalation would be that uh, there will be an assassination. And uh, mm. the assassin if that happens, that w which would fit the opposition the best, would say, oh, the people finally rebelled. Yeah. It was some, some very patriotic Venezuelan that decided that they were going to assassinate Maduro. So, uh, but that's pure speculation, but uh, some, sometimes that's the way these people think. And they, uh, because I, I'm sure he, he has to be concerned about assassination all the time, but it isn't from his own people. <laughs> he yeah. probably has to worry about some of those uh, people that support uh, our, the guy we picked. And you know, how, it just shows how ridiculous interventionism is. We didn't like Saddam Hussein, so we invaded the country. We didn't like Iran either. What's the result? <laughs> you know, Iraq and Iran are joined at the hip. We don't like, to, we don't want the Russians hanging around in the Western Hemisphere. Okay, whatever. But our foreign policy drove Venezuela into the arms of the Russians. The sanctions, trying to undermine them constantly, instead of engaging them with trade, you know, and, and you know, so we drive them into the arms of the Russians, and then we start screaming, oh my gosh, the Russians are here. <laughs> you know, this is not rocket science. Yeah, the they, they don't seem to catch on, and I think that uh, it's all a reflection of bad judgment. 
and also a reflection of those individuals who make the mistakes will never admit there's a mistake. Yeah. I mean, just just thinking back to uh, you know the, the Mueller report, the diehards. Yeah. <laughs> they said, "Oh no, the proof is there." You know, he didn't prove that he didn't do this. You know, this sort of thing. So uh, they they never quit, and that's the way this this will work. And you won't uh, hear the 10 years or so history of what went on in Venezuela, uh, you know, with, with our media, because it's, it's, a, it's pretty solid now, right now. But it fit the scenario, you know, of the uh, anti-Russia thing. Yeah. You, you know, uh, we, we, we have to have a Cold War, and that, that worked out with Syria and, and other places. Even though it's so disappointing to me, because after 89 and 90, there was reason to be excited about what was happening in the world. You know, all of a sudden it settled down, but it didn't take long. Uh, and when I heard we were trading with Russia yeah. and traveling better, I thought there's there's no way we're going to have, uh, uh, you know, a conflict. And I don't think we're on the verge of the conflicts we used to worry about. But uh, we're um, we're in. There's enough conflict to have a pretty hot going Cold War. Yeah. And that's what I think is wanted. I, I don't think the Boltons of the world say, you know, what we need is, uh, you know, to have the tanks roll and have a big fight with it. They never, I don't think they plan those kind of things. They just plan to have moderation and antagonism and we need more weapons, we need more airplanes, we need more ships and, and we need to do this. And then uh, guess what? There's a, there's a um, financial uh, group of people in this country, everywhere from the bankers down to the people who build the guns and the planes, you know, uh, you know are de delighted with this because uh, it's usually at the time they have the budget coming up that there's usually <laughs> a crisis. Oh yeah, we, well, we, really, we really need more money, not less. And it's not an accident that those counties all around D.C. are the wealthiest counties in the country. Yeah. It's not because they're making you know wonderful computers or things. I, mean, I went back and watched a, a video from our old friend Gerald Salenti. They did a, a month or so ago about Venezuela and he made a really good point point. and I think this is what Bolton is trying to do. I think he realized, I think we realized particularly now with the Russians there, we can't go in like we're you know like D-Day and land there. I think they're trying to get the countries around to either allow some kind of an insurgency uh, either U.S. backed or U.S. armed, or to get involved themselves. I think that's what Bolton is up to. But Salenti made a great point. He said there are already three million Venezuelan refugees right now with the economic crisis, all kinds of problems. If they allow this to happen, if they go all in and overthrow, they're going to have three times that much, probably even more. And I think that's why the countries around are resisting. They say, we don't want this. This is going to destroy our economies. Yeah, but uh, they don't come up with uh, much of a solution for it either because of, uh, you know, the conflict. Because basically, we, we see, you know, the response of, of what a, a country like Russia and China does. Very often, uh, it's a reflection and a reaction to what we have done. It isn't, but but the way the message that we get here in this country is that they all they've always started it. They're uh, they're uh, uh, unconstructive, you know, and therefore we have to act and do these things. And they're talking about putting on more sanctions <laughs> on more people. One well, how, can you, how can they put more sanctions on Venezuela? <laughs> what, what are they going to do? You know? That's crazy. Uh, so. Uh, I would just close with something that I've said before. To oppose U.S. government regime change propaganda in places like Venezuela, it doesn't mean you're a commie. It doesn't mean you love Assad. You're opposing war propaganda. But if you repeat war propaganda, you don't get to go claiming, hey, I'm not interventionist. You know, you're repeating it. As Caitlin Johnstone, who spoke at our conference last year, said, you're an unpaid war propagandist for your government if you do that. So pay attention. It's not just about fighting war. Really, it's about fighting war propaganda, which is what we're trying to do. Very good. And uh, I would have to say that uh, the escalation is continuing. I don't think it's uh, rapidly escalating and that we're a lot worse off today than we were yesterday. But it, there's been a steady escalation here in the last uh, year, in the last several months. And I think that that, that will continue. Uh, the thing that I worry about most is not so much that our policies will become outwardly aggressive and, and we'll start dropping bombs in Venezuela, although we participate in dropping bombs on Yemen, and we're still doing that. So we're, we're not guiltless. On, we're guilty of, of that. So uh, I think that the, the, the biggest thing will be that uh, the problems will, will get worse and will involve other people 
get, you know, getting involved and trying to act in, in our behalf. But uh, it, it really boils down to whether or not we should even be, be involved there in a military sense. Yes, we should be involved. People say, oh, you guys are isolationists. You don't want to do anything. Matter of fact, I think we're the opposite of the isolation. The isolationists uh, want to uh, isolate people, put on sanctions, put, uh, put on tariffs, and drop bombs on people. So that, that is not what we're advocating. We want to, uh, you know, deal with people who are imperfect because uh, it just happens that our government is imperfect too and that the correction for this is more inner reaction with the people. And I've often made a statement, which I absolutely believe, that, you know, when two countries get together, how about the young people in America and the young people in Vietnam or Iraq, the young people at the age of 18 to 25, they have a meeting and they get together and say, let's have a vote. You know, we're pretty bored now. Let's, let's have a war. So the people in Vietnam and the people in the United States, yeah, let's have a war. And the young people get together and they have a war. No, they're the last ones that want the war. The war is, is done by government agents who live off war. And it's not something new or different. It's been around for a long time. And that is the reason that the libertarian principle of minimizing the power that is put in the hands of the government that makes the difference. And our founders tried to limit this activity by preventing the imperial presidents from making all these decisions, saying the president's not allowed to do these things. He's not supposed to be allowed to put on sanctions and, and penalize people and drop bombs and go to war without a declaration. It was not meant to be that way, and uh, yet it failed. Our Constitution has failed on that. So the big challenge is, is uh, how are we going to restore an interest in having a policy which is closer to what was intended? And there's no easy easy answer to that. My only thing I can think of that we are obligated to do is spread a message of peace and prosperity and why that is the principles that we should follow and we will have a much better chance to promote peace and prosperity throughout the world. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. Please come back soon.